the voices now, they're more muddled. They don't make sense. I thought they were going to try and make me, you know, to try and kill me. Steve had a bad experience with cannabis in his late teens. That's when the voices started talking in his head. I had about four at the time, four or five of them, saying different things at the same time. They used and then to talk to me, and I used and then to tell them back. to piss off. Go if away. I go somewhere, say to the beach, they talk when I'm drinking my beer, and that makes me paranoid. If I go somewhere, they say get to the beach, nerves. they talk when I'm I drinking my beer. Can't switch off from them. Can't switch and that off makes me them. anxious. Steve's story is an increasingly familiar one for this South London GP. Listening to parents has convinced her there's a parallel with the arguments over smoking and lung cancer in the 1950s. It may take decades to prove, but more and more studies are suggesting a link. Fifteen years ago, there was absolutely nobody presenting with cannabis problems at all. It just wasn't, it wasn't on the agenda. Whereas over the last, say, 10 years, I've seen a steady stream of people coming to see me with problems related to cannabis misuse, mainly problems about wanting to stop, but also problems related to mental health issues like anxiety, uh, paranoid feelings. What's worrying doctors and psychiatrists is that cannabis users are starting younger, when the pathways of the brain are still forming. I think I would have said I was about 14 when I started, um, living in a very isolated small town in South Wales. It was just generally, uh, I hesitate to say the done thing, but it was very prevalent in the, the social circles that I moved around in. I think I was 14 when I first started using cannabis, and to be honest it probably was mainly kind of a peer pressure thing. The youngest I've seen is like 11, 12 people starting, not just uh, boys, it's girls as well. It's like buying uh, fish and chips from a shop. You can go, buy, pay a tenner or even fiver. They even give you credit. But when Steve became psychotic, um, that was the most terrifying um, period in my life. And Terry Hammond has campaigned on mental health issues for the past 20 years. Terry and his family blame cannabis as the trigger for his son Steve's dramatic decline into the psychotic illness that led to voices in his head. Steve was your average teenager. He was a lively uh, young man. He, he played football, he had girlfriends, he used to go out every night. And, and, and I felt quite excited for him as a young man, you know. Um, but now, looking at the photographs now, I just see a young man who was a shadow of himself. Um, you know, he's. I, I just feel so sad for him because he's lost all those years between sort of 21 and he's now 20, 27. If you've got one of these genes, then the chances are very slight. Terry wants to find out whether science can explain why some young people react so badly after taking cannabis, while the majority appear untouched. For years, psychiatrists have noted cannabis use in the case histories of people with psychosis, a catch-all phrase for mental health problems ranging from delusional episodes and hallucinations to schizophrenia. But is it a cause? In landmark studies, Robin Murray and colleagues at London's Institute of Psychiatry found that the risk appears to depend crucially on how old you are when you start. If you started taking cannabis by the age of 18, you were 1.6 times more likely to be psychotic by the time you were 26. But if you started by age 15, you were four and a half times more likely to develop psychosis by the time you were 26. So starting young seems to be a bigger problem. If age at first use is part of the answer, another clue may lie in the role of today's stronger forms of cannabis, so-called skunk varieties. Skunk is homegrown to increase THC. This tetrahydrocannabinol is the part of the plant that creates the buzz of cannabis. The most recent figures for Britain show that although skunk makes up only a quarter of the market here, THC content rose from 6% to 12% in the space of seven years, in line with most of Europe. The exception is the Netherlands, with THC hitting 14% in skunk and close to 35% in resin. People have access to better information on how to grow the plant. They have access to the equipment used to, to grow it and to grow it to a, a high level of potency. 
with if you go to Amsterdam basically you can buy stuff that will really knock your socks off like um, it's, I don't know actual figures of the amount of stuff it's got in it but I'd say roughly it's got to be twice as strong as the best stuff we get over here The Dutch are traditionally at ease with cannabis, so new trends in how it's produced and used often surface here first. At the coffee shops that sell cannabis here in Maastricht, they talk openly about the new super strong varieties, grown to boost the psychoactive element of the plant. It's relatively easy for under 18 year olds to get hold of cannabis here, according to psychiatrist Jim Banos and it's the combination of their youth and the potency of what they're taking that worries him because of what we already know about the effect of THC on the brain. I see skunk as a particular risk. It is associated with much greater changes in the brain so, uh, that, that are as a result of THC and uh, it has also been shown that uh, the more frequent cannabis use and the greater the potency of cannabis use, the greater the changes that contributes to the risk of schizophrenia? Uh, well, we let people smoke a cannabis cigarette, a marijuana cigarette, and we have two conditions. Uh, he and his team at the university have been testing the effects of cannabis on memory loss, a recognized indicator for early schizophrenia. Cecile Anquette's volunteers don't know if they're smoking real cannabis or not. So this is a test that Abdi will do after he has finished his uh, joint or his marijuana cigarette, and then we will ask him to uh, remember a couple of words, and then after that, I will ask him how many words of this, those he still remembers. And here's where a new and potentially important uh, third element in the schizophrenia jigsaw may be falling into place. She looked to see if there was any difference in the effect of cannabis according to the genetic makeup of her young volunteers. Her results, not yet published, were the talk of an international conference just last month. Kroon, maag, klok. The researchers looked at a particular gene called COMT that shapes how fast individuals break down dopamine, a signaling chemical in the brain that cannabis interferes with. There are two possible versions of this gene called the methionine or M version and the valine or V version. Everybody inherits two copies of the gene, one from each parent. Those who inherit two M versions, the MMs, make up a quarter of the population. One M and one V, the MVs, make up half the population. And two Vs, the VVs, make up the remaining quarter. The test results are among the first to support the view that nature and nurture can combine to influence mental health. If you had the MM variant of the COMT gene, then the effects of cannabis on cognition would be negligible. Whereas if you had the VM variant of the gene, you would be able to remember on average one to two words less uh, as a result of the effect of cannabis. Whereas if you had the VV variant, you would be able to remember three to four words less as a result of cannabis. It shows that in young people who are most at risk of schizophrenia, there's now an environmental risk factor that is clearly associated with the risk of later developing psychosis. And in addition to that, it has been shown that this environmental risk factor is operating in association with a genetic risk. The oldest of Maastricht's 16 coffee shops is a short walk from the university. Good afternoon. Hi. Is well, okay? Hello. The shop survived 22 years of conservative disapproval and its owner isn't cowed by the latest from the scientists. In my experience as a coffee shop owner, and I'm, I've been a coffee shop owner for 22 years now, I can tell you that uh, yes, there are some people who have uh, psychotic problems with the, uh, when they use cannabis, but that's not a problem of the product, it's a problem of those people. They already have those uh, psychotic problems. And the, the, the cannabis is a trigger effect, which could have happened also when they should, uh, would have used alcohol, for example. I don't entirely agree with what Mark says in the sense that if you've got a vulnerability for psychosis, uh, genetic or otherwise, 
then cannabis may worsen the prognosis, the outcome of that vulnerability into uh, onset of first psychotic symptoms and first episode of schizophrenia. What's more, when the British team went back and tested DNA from people in their previous studies, they found a similar pattern. In a paper to be published this month, they say this helps explain why only a small minority of cannabis users develop psychosis. MMs in the study who smoked cannabis as adolescents had a minimal rise in their risk of developing schizophrenia. For the MVs, the risk went up two and a half times. But the VVs who smoked cannabis as adolescents were ten times more likely to develop schizophrenia. Now we know that COMT, COMT, is involved in the metabolism of dopamine. So it looks as if some individuals, by virtue of a sort of chance transmission of a particular gene, are more or less at risk if they take cannabis in adolescence. If you take a little cannabis, you're not going to go psychotic. But if you batter at it and you happen to have other predisposing factors, then you may well go psychotic. The studies so far are based on large populations of people. But Terry Hammond and his son Steve were intrigued to see if the scientists could tell them anything meaningful about Steve's genes and his vulnerability to psychosis if smoking cannabis. A small contract testing company in Hertfordshire agreed to tell us which of the three possible genetic variations Steve had inherited. In the case of, of this display here, you can see three clear clusters. Um, and in the case of the COMT gene, um, you can see that the red group here shows the MM variant, the green group here shows the MV variant, and the blue group here shows the VV variant. What was our result? So, well, if you look, um, we actually put Steve onto um, this plate four times just so we could be 100% certain of the data for you. And the four green dots that I've just highlighted there are actually Steve. Um, and you can see very clearly that Steve is the MV variant. Right. This result for Steve may look crystal clear. In fact, it's anything but. This is not a diagnostic test. The scientists haven't run it through the sheer volume of people they would need to be certain of its power to predict. And the researchers warn that as a test for an individual, this genetic marker would probably be wrong more often than it would be right. The fact that Steve has an MV result is no more than a hint at his vulnerability to mental illness. Scientists would need perhaps a dozen or so genetic markers to accurately predict an individual's outcome. It's a glimpse into a not too distant future, perhaps just five years away, when society will have to grapple with the implications of such tests. Skeptics believe we're much further away from understanding how our brains interact with the world around us to create conditions such as schizophrenia. They argue that if the link with cannabis was strong, we should already have seen a rise in cases to match the growth in cannabis use. But there's disagreement over how to measure such trends and too few studies to be sure. John McLeod, who's reviewed the current research, thinks it's too early to draw firm conclusions. He's uneasy that each study uses different definitions of cannabis use and psychotic illness. At the moment, I don't think it's possible to conclude that cannabis use definitely causes psychosis. Cannabis and psychosis may have common antecedents, um, basically related to adversity in early life, um, possibly related to nutritional factors or infection or factors that we just don't know about. Um, and these may lead um, to psychosis and may also lead to an association between cannabis use and psychosis, but it doesn't um, follow that uh, cannabis use causes psychosis. The science is far from rock solid, and it doesn't yet translate into simple political solutions. Not one of the scientists we spoke to sees tougher classification for the drug as the answer. We still don't know who's most at risk, so the one practical move they agree on is to discourage young teenagers from getting their kicks from cannabis.